Welcome back to Intro Psychology. Now we're starting Unit 3, Biopsychology. And this unit includes such things as understanding our nervous system, our endocrine system, and how genetics interplay with psychology. We're going to start off by talking about our nervous system. And we can talk about this in lots of different ways, including looking at the neuron, which is the smallest component of our nervous system that, that is one cell. We can also look at the central nervous system. This includes things like our brain and our spinal cord. And there's also the peripheral nervous system, which is the neurons going to our extremities throughout the entire body. We're going to start off today by talking about the neuron first. And so when we think about the neuron, it's, uh, there's lots of different neurons that look in many different ways. So our purple neuron here on screen is just one example of what a neuron could look like. And the neuron is not the only cell in our nervous system. We're now very much aware of things like glial cells. And so glial cells are often considered support cells that help our nervous system to function uh, more, efficiency, more efficiently. And we're also going to talk about neurotransmitters in a little bit. Let's get to the neuron in detail now. So the neuron is this very complex cell in the body. It's very different from something like a skin cell or a bone cell. Uh, it has lots of different components that you may not see in all other types of cells in the body. For instance, it has dendrites at the first. These dendrites are where it obtains the input of new information. Then it has the soma. That's going to be most similar to other cells in the body you may be familiar with that contains things like Golgi bodies, organelles, the nuclei, and the DNA center. And then there is this long tubular axon in many neurons in our nervous system. And this is a, a bit of a cord that helps us to relay information. This can be insulated with what's known as a myelin sheath. At the other end of the cell is the terminal buttons, and these help to package uh, and distribute new information. And that releases things into the synapse or the extracellular space. So we're gonna go through that again, uh, just a little bit more in detail, uh, going through these different components. So the dendrites are the first part we're going to talk about, and they're highlighted here in pink. They kind of look like little hairs sticking off of the soma. And so dendrites comes from the tree in Greek because they kind of look like branches. And so these are the neural receptors. There's receptor sites on the dendrites that kind of work like puzzle pieces. And when certain neurotransmitters or chemicals or proteins in our system bond with the receptor sites on the dendrites, this helps to start the relay of information throughout a neuron. Now, as mentioned, the dendrites are attached to the soma. So the soma is really the body. It comes from the word body. This is where we're going to see the nucleus and the organelles. And this is where we're going to convert lots of different uh, noise into an impulse in the neuron. Uh, and so there's lots of different parts of the soma we're not too worried about for this course. There, there is things like the axon hillock, which starts off the impulse, but don't, don't worry about that for this course. Then we have the axon. The axon is really where the action is in a neuron. And some axons can be extraordinarily long. In fact, one of the longest axons in most mammalian species uh, is called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is a nerve that starts at the back of our neck and it goes down, loops around the aorta in our heart and goes back up through our chest. And the vagus nerve is a nerve that you, you can feel the impact of the vagus nerve if you ever have a heartwarming sensation or watching a really sappy commercial and you kind of feel like this melting feeling in your chest, a sort of happy, weepy cry. Uh, that can be the vagus nerve. It's an emotional response nerve, if you will. Uh, and so there are many long axons. Some axons uh, run for very long distances in our legs, for example. And I should also mention that in mammalian species, aside from humans, the vagus nerve is still one nerve. So if you think about a giraffe, there is one long axon going down the neck of the giraffe and then back up the other side of the neck of the giraffe. So that's a very long nerve cell. And one of the things we're looking at in the axon uh, is how it engages in this wave-like uh, response. So what I have illustrated here, you'll see the same neuron kind of illustrated five times over. And in the first instance, we can see the first segment of the axon has turned pink. That's representing that it's now depolarized. Then as the, as the first segment turns pink, uh, then it makes the second segment also turn pink. And so the second segment's now depolarized and the blue means it's repolarizing. So if we keep following the third, fourth, and fifth illustration of the neuron on the screen here, we can see how it's sort of, if you're at 
had a professional sports game and everyone does the wave, they put their hands up and the next group of people put their hands up. Uh, that is what our axon is doing. As one segment of the axon becomes depolarized, it causes a wave like a domino effect and that the next segment of the axon will become depolarized and the next and the next and the next. And after depolarizing comes repolarizing. Now this is a bit complicated, so we're gonna go into this a bit more in detail when we talk about the action potential. So in terms of the action potential, we have to understand a little bit of chemistry to appreciate this psychology. And one of the things going on in the axon, it's illustrated here in the yellow rectangle, is there's many different ions inside and outside of the axon. These include negative charged proteins, uh, negative charged chloride, but also positively charged sodium and positively charged potassium. So potassium is noted here with the K plus and sodium is noted here with the Na plus. And we're really particularly interested in the sodium and the potassium. Now there's lots of really cool mechanisms that happen with the membrane of our neurons. Uh, but one of the things that does happen is the sodium potassium pump that helps to exchange sodium and potassium ions uh, into the uh, axon of the neuron. So it's important to understand that our nervous system works a lot like an electrical system. In fact, there are voltages in our nervous system at all times, much like electrical wires. When our axons are not firing, when our neurons are not firing, we actually have a negative charge. It's about a negative 70 millivolts that we have. And so when we look at this and we look at one segment of the axon, and so at our, what we call a resting potential, when the axon's not firing, what we find is the sodium potassium pump plays a large role in exchanging sodium and potassium ions uh, over the membrane of the axon. And so the, the yellow triangle drawn here is showing one segment, just one segment of our axon. So on the last slide, you saw five different segments. This is just showing one segment along the axon tape. And so once the neuron starts to get uh, a signal that could happen when something bonds with the dendrites and it goes through the soma and it gets processed in the axon hillock. When this signal is received, the membrane along the outside of this axon is going to shift. And this allows the Na or the sodium to flow a little bit differently. And the sodium starts to enter the cell uh, more often. And that means there's more positive ions in the cell, which means the voltage starts to become more positive. So you can see down here on the line chart, this is where the yellow line at negative 70 just starts to go up just a little bit. And when it reaches that dotted line for this segment of the axon, we hit when the action potential can happen. And so the action potential now, this is when the membrane properties shift again, and now more sodium is going to cross, which means it's going to become even more positive. Uh, and so it's going to keep uh, bringing in those positive ions until the segment of the axon reaches a peak charge, peak positive charge at plus 30 millivolts. And so this is at the tip of the line chart here. Now, as this segment of the axon is doing this, it's going to influence the next segment of the axon and the next segment in a domino effect. And so at the peak, uh, at plus 30 millivolts, we're gonna find that, again, the properties of the neuron shift in this one segment of the axon, and now we hit repolarization. So at the peak, now it has to go backwards. Now the sodium gates close, the potassium gates open, and we actually find those positive potassium ions that start off mainly on the inside will now start to leave the neuron. And so those, those are starting to leave, and this creates a drop in voltage. So this is the idea that went from peak of positive 30, now it's starting to lose its voltage and gradually become less positive and will start to become more negative. And so hyperpolarization is when now we dip down so low that it becomes less than uh, or more negative than negative 70 millivolts. It's even lower than our resting potential. And now we have, it's a dramatically negatively charged part of our axon and there's lots of positive ions outside. And so this is when it's uh, preventing a second action potential. Now this rest period is extraordinarily short, uh, almost immeasurably so if you don't have advanced scientific equipment. Um, it's important to note that you can't just fire forever. It might seem like your neurons are firing forever if you're staring at a bright light and it constantly seems like you're getting overstimulated, but every unique neuron in your body can only fire for an instant and then stop. Now it could fire and then fire again and then fire again and then fire again, which it might make things seem more intense or it could be more spaced out. And so this makes us understand that neuron firings and action potentials are binary. 
you don't have a more intense action potential or a less intense. A neuron cannot send a stronger or weaker signal. Although we, our brain tends to interpret signals as stronger or weaker, at the absolute neurological level, each symbol, it's like a light switch, it's on or off and it doesn't have a dimmer. And so uh, again, the frequency of the firing is what makes us perceive things as more intense. In addition, the amount of neurons firing. So if you're looking at a dim light, there might only be some neurons in your optical system firing, but if you're looking at a bright light, there may be more neurons firing. Now, one of the things we have to know about the axon uh, is because it works like an electrical system, because we have these negative and positive voltage, uh, our axons do work a lot like electrical wires. And much like if you had a copper wire, we know a copper wire would be a lot safer and efficient if we wrap it in some rubber insulation. And if the rubber starts to break, that might be a problem for our wires. The same thing works for most of the axons in our nervous system. And so we have what's known as the myelin sheath. So this improves the speed at which the axon can relay information and therefore improves our neurological system. Now the myelin sheath doesn't insulate the entire axon. It tends to leave these little gaps called the nodes of Ranvier. And what happens is when we go to exchange the sodium and potassium ions, they can't exchange through the myelin sheath. They can only exchange during these gaps at the nodes of Ranvier. So rather than having to exchange them at this segment of the axon and this segment at the axon and this segment at the axon, what tends to happen uh, is the, the ion exchange happens at one node of Ranvier and then leaps to the next node and then leaps to the next node. So this way it's not the whole length of the axon that goes through this action potential ion exchange, it's just the nodes. So this becomes more efficient, it's a bit more like leapfrog, and it means that the electrical responses in our nervous system travel faster and more efficiently. So the myelin sheath helps us uh, to, to do this at a faster rate. Now, this is when we often start to think about gray matter, white matter, if you will. The myelin does look more like white matter, so it's going to look, so the white matter is the part that is going to be the insulated myelins. Another part of the neuron that we need to talk about is that of the terminal buttons. So the terminal buttons highlighted here in pink, these are the other end of the neuron in this illustration opposite the dendrites. Keep in mind, this is just one example of what a neuron could look like. Uh, but this part is where we start to make uh, little packages of neurotransmitters. And so this is the idea, there's these little synaptic vesicles and it packages up these little chemicals in these, um, I almost think of them as little bubbles, but they don't really look like bubbles, but I think of them that way. And they, they release them into the extracellular space. So the terminal buttons is what sends these little uh, neurotransmitters out into the world to go and interact with the other neurons. So it's the output system. And once the terminal buttons release that, well, then we can start to talk about the synapse. And the synapse is how neuron one would communicate with neuron two. Keep in mind the word synapse is used in psychology in a couple different ways. Uh, in many different textbooks, you may see the word synapse used as a noun referring to the terminal button region of the neuron. For all intents and purposes, I'll refer to that as the terminal buttons to kind of keep that separate. You may also see it used in textbooks to refer to a noun, meaning the extracellular space, the space between two neurons. So we often talk about the gap between two neurons as the synapse. I'll be using the term extracellular space, and I'll be trying to only exclusively use the word synapse to talk about the verb of communication between the neurons, uh, just to make it a bit more simple. And so uh, the communication between the neurons, the act of communicating, often called the synapse. So this is when they communicate. So we can see here in the illustration, we have the terminal button area highlighted in pink on one neuron, the dendrites highlighted in pink on a second neuron, and the little, the little synaptic vesicles are uh, the little, little packages of neurotransmitters with little blue dots. So let's talk about synaptic communication in more detail. What we find here is, uh, first thing is our first neuron will release the synaptic vesicles. And these synaptic vesicles, if you recall, they contain the neurotransmitters. Neuron two, on the other hand, uh, receives these neurotransmitters and some of them will begin to bind the receptor sites on the dendrites. I just point to my hair because I think of my hair as the dendrites and my brain as the soma, if you will. And so the neurotransmitters will bind with the receptors on the dendrites. And so neuron one uh, releases them, neuron two collects them, but neuron two often can't collect all of them. What often happens, let's say this is a serotonin uh, uh, chain. So neuron one releases lots of serotonin, neuron two collects as much serotonin as they can get. But if neuron one made too much serotonin, one of the things it can do is it can engage in reuptake. 
Reuptake is actually when the terminal buttons on that end of neuron one will actually recollect the, the synaptic vesicles and it will gather the extra serotonin up through reuptake and then they can reuse it. This helps to conserve energy in neuron one. It also helps to conserve neurotransmitters so we're not making proteins in our body that go to waste. Uh, but sometimes reuptake can be a bit overly aggressive to the point that neuron one can reuptake before neuron two has fully absorbed the neurotransmitters. And so this is one of the mechanisms at play in popular pharmaceutical drugs such as uh, antidepressants known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. What an SSRI drug does is it prevents neuron one from being overly aggressive with its reuptake. It makes it kind of relax a little bit so it, it still does reuptake but not as fully as it used to.